My name is Tom McHugh. I'm the team leader for the lab of circuit and behavioral physiology uh, here at Recon CBS. And I also have uh, adjunct appointments at the University of Tokyo and Waseda University. Um, so many of you would like to be in Japan now, perhaps visiting. Um, so I'll, I'll take you there virtually. If you are in Japan or if you've visited here before, you might recognize this. Um, this is a very famous intersection outside of Shibuya Station called Shibuya Scramble. Um, and the first time I came to Japan was as a graduate student in 1999. Um, and I have a very vivid memory of my first visit here. It was early in my trip. I remember the students I was with. It was crowded, it was exciting, very novel. I remember where we went for lunch and what we ate. Um, and that type of memory, that what we call an episodic memory, we know depends on a part of the brain called the hippocampus. Um, and that is one of the primary interests of my lab is trying to understand how this structure, um, in, in my case, mice, underlies this memory function. But what we leverage to do that is study a different role or kind of an overlapping role it has, especially in the rodent, and that's for spatial representation and navigation. And you can think of it like this, you know, I, now that I've been in Japan for almost 13 years, I come back to this intersection now and again to take my kids shopping or go to dinner with my wife. And since now it's a, a familiar spot, I can come out of a, a different exit or a different type of, uh, a different time of day and I can navigate in this space. My repeated visits to this location have given me a, a spatial map of this, this neighborhood, and I can get to my goal, be it you know, the store, or the restaurant I'm trying to find. And this type of navigation through space also requires hippocampus. And that's kind of this, this duality between memory and, and space is, is what we leverage and how we study memory um, using uh, the mouse in, in my laboratory. So if you're not a, a physiologist, so a lot of what we do is physiology, I like to use this as an example. So even if you've never done physiology, you've probably listened to music. And if you go and sit down and hear a concert, what you're really appreciating is the organization of information in space and time, right? And the different people on the stage uh, during the concert play different roles. And so you have the conductor who's kind of in charge of the timing. I'm messing up all my slides today. And you have the musicians who are providing the information, the notes. And what we try to do to understand the brain is understand how information is organized in space and time. But instead of the conductor, we use oscillations. It changes in populations activity that we record in the local field potential, or in the case of humans, you can record this with EEG, and information, which is the spiking of neurons. And we do experiments to try to see how these things change in different parts of memory. So kind of the overarching theme of my lab over the last decade or so is trying to figure out how information is organized when we're encoding memories, when we're consolidating memories, or when we're recalling memories. And so, like I said, we focus on the hippocampus. In the mouse, this big green structure looks like a banana. That's the mouse hippocampus. And you can see it, it has uh, several advantages as a model system. Not only is it important for memory, which is our interest, in the rodent, it's a rather large structure. It's close to the cortical surface. So it's kind of easily accessible, especially at this dorsal end um, for things like electrodes or microscope lenses um, or viral injections. It's a pretty easy target. And we leverage all those things to try to study function. And so primarily my lab is organized around kind of three principles. And that's kind of monitoring in vivo activity. Traditionally, we're a physiology lab using tetrodes, but uh, you know the world's changing, so we have to keep up. So we also do now calcium imaging. We do physiology with tetrodes, silicon probes. More recently, we started using NeuroPixel, these high density reporting uh, probes. We use one photon uh, miniscopes for calcium imaging, as well as fiber photometry. Um, and then we kind of combine this ability to monitor activity with genetic approaches that give us access to manipulate uh, neurons or circuits in the brain. We keep a, a very large mouse colony with over 30 types of mice, including many Cree lines that give us genetic access to regions or cell types. We produce a uh, virus in-house. Um, I have a, a technician who's a, a viral magician, and so he makes all our AAVs. We have over kind of 200 flavors of AAVs in stock, and we can kind of custom make small batches for pilot experiments, as well as pseudo rabies virus for circuit tracing and manipulation. Um, and then we combine this with all the usual suspects, dreads, optogenetics, um, G-camps, these kind of things. And then we have a full behavioral facility and 
again, keeping up with the evolution of the field, we're now uh, have been implementing these kind of machine learning or uh, deep neural network based tracking pose estimation um, things like uh, deep lab cut that have been um, really, really uh, kind of groundbreaking in the ability to break down different behaviors, um, much more than we used to get with just tracking in all position. So the little bit of science I'll tell you, because this is a very short talk, um, is that if you're not familiar in the mouse hippocampus or the rat hippocampus as well, there's these place cells uh, in Japanese, basho saibo, and we leverage the ability to record and um, uh, monitor the activity of these neurons, uh, both on the single neuron level as well as across large populations to try to relate changes in the physiology of these neurons, um, which looks something like this. I won't go into details again, both when the animal is, is walking uh, or exploring or learning a task, as well as when he's resting or sleeping, when we think um, reactivation of these neurons and hopefully what we think of as the animal's memories are important for things like consolidation. And so the studies in my lab kind of fall into a few different baskets. Uh, many, like I said, focus on kind of the control and decoding of the physiology of, of uh, memory. Um, we look at changes in the temporal organization and, and memory dysfunction in mouse mutants or when we manipulate uh, circuits with things like tetanus toxin or dread or optogenetics. Um, we leverage our ability to do large scale recording and decoding to look at population activities. Um, we're very interested in kind of different physiological signatures of memory, both for memory's formation in, in Casa's paper and memory consolidation in, in Yuichi's paper. Um, a second main interest is kind of novelty and memory modulation. Um, recently, we've been working on a, um, on a circuit from the hypothalamus, from the um, posterior hypothalamus, the supramammalar nucleus, into the dorsal hippocampus and its role in novelty detection and its effects on hippocampal physiology. We've long been interested in neuromodulation and monoamines, um, and most of these papers are, are through our collaborators as well, um, focused on um, the role of noradrenaline in, in different processes, um, both in neurons and effects on neurons and on glia. Um, we do projects that are kind of towards translation, so disease, disease models, um, hippocampus, obviously it's easy to study epilepsy. We have a series of papers, including a recent review on stress and the hippocampus, um, autism models, Down syndrome models, and uh, Alzheimer's models as well. And finally, uh, one great thing about Recon is that we have kind of lots of resources and the ability to collaborate. And so we like to do things, um, kind of side projects sometimes, but not always uh, in the tech realm of technology and tool development. So we worked on non-invasive imaging and then collaboration, these kind of circuit labeling techniques, as well as some um, non-invasive, a different kind of non-invasive imaging in freely moving animals. Um, so that's kind of the, the synapse, uh, synopsis, not the synapse of my lab. And, you know, we're kind of continue to work on these structures, not just the hippocampus, but it's interconnections with other regions like the supramammalar nucleus, uh, the septum, and the cortex, trying to answer questions um, about memory and how it changes um, with dysfunction and disease. So that's it. The lab has traditionally been very international. Um, I've had people, including staff and students from uh, all over the world and come and stay, go back uh, to other places all over the world. And um, if you're interested, you know, feel free to contact me, um, talk to me later today, or visit our website, which is on the bottom here. So thank you for your attention.